Welcome to our webcast, Increasing Reliability and Decrease Cost with New Generation of Medium Voltage Switchgear, sponsored by Schneider Electric. I'm your moderator for today, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Plant Engineering. Now I'm happy to introduce today's presenter, Jeff Jordan. Jeff Jordan is currently the Offer Manager with Metal Enclosed Products for Schneider Electric. Prior to his current role, he was engineering lead for metal enclosed medium voltage switchgear. Jeff, Jeff has 20 years of experience in the field and earned his MBA from Vanderbilt University Owen School of Business in 2014. He received his professional engineer license in machine design in 2007 and his bachelor's of science in engineering from University of Michigan Naval Architecture in 1995. I'm Mark Hosky, webcast uh, moderator for today and content manager for Control Engineering and CFE Media. Jeff, we're ready to begin the presentation. The floor is all yours. Great. Hello. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, good afternoon from Nashville. Thanks for taking time to join me today. Uh, as he said, my name is Jeff Jordan. I'm the offer manager at Schneider Electric for the group of medium voltage products that we call metal enclosed switch gear. And, uh, and my objective today with this presentation is to talk to you about how Schneider Electric is addressing new challenges facing the power distribution industry uh, and, and what we're calling the new generation of medium voltage switch gear. Specifically, I want to peel back the onion a little bit for you and uh, talk about the technical advancements in our industry that are changing the look and feel of some of our medium voltage switch gear for the better, uh, and how these changes are improving product reliability and reducing total ownership costs. Okay, so let's get started. Let's start with the money. CapEx and OpEx, well, it's no secret that our economy is not growing very quickly right now. So we're left fighting for every dollar we want to spend. And uh, we want more for our money. We want it to stretch a little farther. And this is true certainly for big capital ex expenses as well as operating budgets. On the left, we have the workforce. We're seeing that skilled maintenance workforce is uh, shrinking. In fact, it's fairly well known that a lot of these workers uh, are approaching retirement age. And uh, the question is, who's going to fill their shoes after they after they retire. Uh, who's going to keep our uptime? So the industry is beginning to look for products that are more reliable, of course, and easier to maintain. Now how about equipment space? When capital funds are made available, space for electrical distribution equipment becomes an issue. In the case of upgrading existing facilities, uh, certainly this is a, a a tight constraint, usually space footprint is, is the major issue with uh, power distribution equipment. And very often, uh, we're pinned in, not only uh, side to side, but also uh, in height restrictions. This is not necessarily the case for Greenfield's applications, but it's very common that the footprint becomes an issue just because of the cost of, of a square foot. And of course, it's certainly our job to ensure the safety of our workforce, not just today, but for years to come. So these are the big challenges. How do we do it? Today we're going to talk about addressing these challenges by improving reliability without breaking the bank. So we're going to discuss a new generation of medium voltage products and first, we'll march down the left side of this agenda and then the right. Starting with reliability, we're going to discuss corona and insulation. That's insulation, I-N-S-U-L. I will also get, you'll see on the right side, installation. So bear with me. It can be a little confusing. I'll try to speak clearly. We need to talk about maintenance intervals and how that addresses safety uh, and affects safety. We'll talk about advancements in environmental robustness. And then we need to discuss circuit breakers, not so much advancements in circuit breakers as it is uh, how these new advancements affect circuit breakers and circuit breaker design. And then we'll talk a little bit about asset monitoring and 
where we're headed in the future. In terms of cost, most of the time we're, we're really focused on installation, I-N-S-T-A, and uh, certainly there are two aspects of that, the cost of material and the cost of the labor to install it. But I think we'd all agree that there are more pieces to total ownership cost, and the selection of the equipment and the design is expensive. Uh, certainly one aspect of our cost. In addition, there's, there's, a, there's an expense of maintenance. A lot of time on that today. And uh, finally, the cost of the, the flexibility of future growth, the ability to expand. Okay, so let's jump jump right into the meat of it, insulation. One of the major issues that we need to address in increasing switch gear reliability is at the component level, the design of the component insulation. You can see here in the middle of the screen uh, what I'm going to refer to as an ideal design. So let me try to explain it. What you notice there is an analytical model showing equipotential lines, meaning uh, that the potential is graduated from the high voltage side at medium voltage level, is, let's call it 15 kV, and then it gradually uh, changes to the low voltage side, which could be potentially uh, zero, zero volts. And so over this, over this insulation, the idea in an ideal design is to have a very steady march of lower and lower voltage in a controlled manner. Now, uh, for anyone who's been around this equipment, certainly my experience has been in the lab. Uh, corona is, is very real and easy to smell, taste, see. Uh, a quick story about Corona uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in my background. I was working for the U.S. Navy originally, and there were stories about sailing ships and Corona. We used to call it St. Elmo's Fire. And these corona discharges were known to ships for years because on the top of the mast uh, there would be a glow at night sometimes when a ship is passing through an electrical storm. Sailors thought of it as a warning because if that glow ever discharged, uh, basically it was an omen of a, of a shipwreck. And that's because that discharge was going somewhere. It was, in fact, going to ground, and the ship was about to run aground. So uh, I want you to think of corona as a warning. I certainly do. And what we're looking at here is, uh, is, a, is a way to manage this kind of a warning from the start with the design. If you look at the image on the right, we're talking about noisy versus uh, quiet. This corona has a, a sound. sounds kind of like frying, uh, maybe something on the stove. And anytime you hear that, that's the warning. You can also taste it. It tastes like an electrical storm. When you're approaching an electrical storm, you smell that uh, new air. And, uh, and so that's, that's basically the phenomenon. If a component is not designed uh, ideally, let's say, the magnetic fields, the electric fields, they start to come out away from the uh, component. And the insulation is meant to manage that. And it's, it's common to have very small discharges from time to time. But if the discharges are focused in one place for long enough, years, there's some degradation to the insulation. So it's possible today with computer models and uh, lab techniques to measure this and monitor this, and even in some cases to eliminate uh, discharges, certainly at the component level. So maybe you've heard of uh, you know, gas-insulated switchgear, air-insulated switchgear. That gas is part of the insulation system. Uh, that air, you know, although it, it may seem like it's, uh, there's nothing there, in fact, the air is part of the insulation system. And these discharges don't always have to be from sharp parts on the uh, conductive component. Sometimes the sharp can be on the ground inside the switchgear enclosure itself. So we have some new developments here, and uh, one of them I want to tell you about is 2SIS. This is the shielded solid insulation system of a product we call PremSet. But the idea is that this ideal design is worked into the insulation of the bus bars so that the exterior is actually at zero potential 
and the lines are very shapely, very smooth. And as a result, the high voltage is contained uh, very nicely. And this happens over time, uh, too, because basically there's no degradation at some sharp point in the enclosure. And so we're working very hard with analytical processes uh, to, to design parts that have this uh, look and feel. And we're working uh, then in the lab to confirm it analytically. Uh, and so this is, this is definitely a big development in the industry. Moving on, I want to talk a little bit about maintenance intervals. Uh, <clears throat> another development that's uh, increasing reliability is by designing out some of the top issues we see today in medium voltage switchgear. Among these are loose joints and hot spots, and, uh, and so there are several methods to addressing this, but one of the most simple is vibration-resistant hardware. This kind of hardware was developed originally for satellites that are launched into space. Certainly that rocket ride is a, is a lot of vibration. And so there was a, a very simple fastener developed for the space industry that instead of having a typical two threads of engagement, which we see with normal nut and bolts uh, everywhere, this particular nut was developed to give a spiral connection. And uh, there are several, originally there was one company, and there seem to be several of these industry standard type uh, connections. But you can imagine that that spiral connection uh, is, has more friction and simply engages better. And as a result, uh, the joint stays tight longer. In many cases, it stays tight uh, for up to 10 years. And so this is, again, a major development. Now, in the case where we're not so sure that it stays tight, there are monitoring uh, systems. And so this lower image is of a, of a system that, asset, that the monitors are assets, especially at the critical joints, uh, hot spots. The little orange sensors are, there are several now, several different technologies that create this sort of uh, sensor. And they offer uh, batteryless, wireless monitoring of joints. In the box, in the enclosure, we would have an antenna and the antenna uh, sends a signal through the air to this sensor, which receives the signal, processes it, sends it back, and without any wire and without any battery, uh, gives us some interpretation of what's happening there at the joint. And so over time, we can watch trends in our most critical spots. Okay, and I, I want to take a little turn here and talk about developments in grounding. Certainly this is important and uh, can usually be managed by process, but if we look at the techniques on the left, manual grounding, uh, typically it's, it's common in our industry to put uh, balls, grounding balls, on ground connections that are covered by a boot. And so the method goes like this, you interrupt the, the load, you open the enclosure, and, uh, and you look for this boot to pop off with a hot stick. Of course, to do it, you need to be suited up, fully suited with PPE because you're approaching uh, a system you haven't confirmed is, is grounded. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's some issues here that have always plagued us, and, uh, and putting that strap on is, is of course, the, the, best, the best path forward. Now we're moving into uh, systems that have internal grounding. And so this development is allowing procedures to be rewritten, uh, or even better, to be left alone, but to leave us with an image, a uh, visual means of confirming that the enclosure, that, that the switchgear is in fact in the grounded position before we open the door. So if we read this little graph on the, on the right side, from left to right, you see in the first position it's closed, and so that's in operating condition. And then the second middle image shows us with the switch in the open position. So there's still potential down on the lower side, uh, potentially. But the, the switch is, in fact, open, so the current's not flowing. And then as we see on the right, what you're looking at is it's now grounded out. And if 
if a switchgear has this con kind of configuration, it's possible to have grounded uh, the components in the in the space in the compartment where you're about to enter before going in with your hot stick. A significant improvement potentially in, in safety and reliability of grounding systems. Now, there's some concern from time to time, and so I want to show a couple of applications uh, that, okay, well, if I ground my system, you know, have I, have I lost some of my architectural uh, uh, freedom? Uh, for example, am I, am I now forced, because I have a breaker perhaps that's uh, fixed in position and uh, with this upstream disconnect, am I forced to take the whole lineup out, uh, the, whole, the whole zone, in order to access anything in there? Well, no. In fact, uh, that's possible, like the one on the right. You can see in this one line that the whole zone could be taken out and, and grounded at one single disconnect. But that's not necessary. It's also possible to have each feeder independent and, and ground out each side. So no limitations uh, necessarily. Oops. Oh, thank you. So if we talk about uh, another, another development that's happening here is, is in environmental robustness. And if we think about this uh, from the vacuum interrupter perspective, we've had this kind of environmental robustness for years, maybe since the 50s. Uh, certainly our interrupters today are sealed and, uh, and maintains the vacuum. And so all of the interruption is performed inside that bottle, uh, the white bottle inside the green box. But why not extend that kind of idea a little further? Why not take it to the disconnect uh, above so that any, any uh, potential grounding is done in a closed environment, factory sealed? This is what we're doing with a product called HVLCB uh, at Schneider Electric. And then the, the bottom uh, image there inside the green box is a breaker. It's a very small breaker, innovative. This is part of our PremSet solution. And you can see that it's black and, uh, in fact, almost encapsulated. And when we go in this direction, we're beginning to move into um, maybe taking the advantages of air-insulated switchgear, uh, but it's almost as encapsulated as a gas-insulated system. This breaker here is factory sealed and black because it has the grounding, uh, the grounding, the shielding on the outside. And so that system has already been uh, designed to be factory sealed for the interruption and also uh, those lines we were talking about in terms of corona and the warnings, they're mitigated by the very nature of the bus bars, which have insulation inside, solid insulation, but, but shielding on the outside. This is extremely attractive as we start to talk about applications in dusty environments and chemical environments. And uh, of course, we all have the very real world problem that these switchgear Enclosures are warm, and there's intrusion sometimes by uh, snakes or mice. And of course, they inadvertently cross the phases and uh, can, cause, can cause problems. OK, so a note about breakers. This is uh, pretty exciting. I, as, as I mentioned in my bio, I'm actually in charge of the metal enclosed portion. Uh, of our medium voltage offer, which is the which is the uh, C37.20.3 classification of, of switchgear. Traditionally, switchgear has always been uh, switchgear with breakers has always been managed under the C37.20.2 category. Obviously, they're both in the 20 family, uh, but dot two was the metal clad switchgear, still is. And metal clad switchgear has, by design, by standard, a racked out position. That racked out position is meant to be uh, some indication that you have removed all power from the breaker. But there are a lot of moving parts, and, uh, and uh, sh the shutters, for example, and everything associated with the moving parts are spec'd in by the, by the standard. Breakers are now available in, in the metal enclosed switchgear and allows us to rethink the racking position a little bit. Certainly, we've had some customers explain to us that, uh, that they have some issues with, with racking. In the case of the middle picture, that's an Evolus breaker. 
from the HVLCB product. And you'll note that, uh, of course, we're looking at the rear side of it. You'll note that it doesn't have the finger clusters that are typical of a metal clad breaker. Instead, it's fixed in position. Uh, but you, although it's impossible to see from this small picture, there are actually little wheels on that breaker, and it can be removed for maintenance activity. On the far right is our Premset offer. And uh, now it's small, but it's not actually that small. You can see that in perspective, it's, it's kind of tiny. The, the black part in the middle of a breaker. And uh, I mean, it's the size, is the, basically the, the equivalent of the breaker on the left. Uh, it is a breaker, and it is about 50% the volume of a, of a normal a VR, uh, sorry, a metal clad style breaker. It's factory sealed and fixed into position. So one of the big uh, advancements right now, of course, is in monitoring these assets and checking for temperature, uh, watching for hot spots, listening for corona discharges. Of course, now we're moving into the maintenance phase, and, and this state-of-the-art technology is excellent, and, and it does cost a little money, but uh, the value is there. Certainly, it, it makes a lot of sense in most applications. Uh, monitoring the temperature is a really good way of watching, uh, making sure you don't have a situation where the joints have come loose. Because what happens when the joints do come loose is that the temperature across the uh, across the interface of the two pieces of bus bar increases. And there's a point at which it continues to increase. So we definitely want to watch and make sure it's, uh, it's not trending up. Uh, these numbers are usually very stable and easy to measure and uh, well known by the manufacturers. And so as a result, an industry has developed around monitoring these systems and looking through infrared windows with infrared scanning devices. <coughs> And these devices uh, are, are uh, extremely effective and uh, highly calibrated and precise instruments. The problem we have with, with infrared sensing is that in order to take the measurement, we have to go up uh, very close to the switchgear. We have to, in fact, approach the switchgear and put the, monitor, put the monitoring device against it. So if there is a risk, if there is a problem inside the enclosure, uh, there's a, we may have inadvertently approached a gear that has a problem. And uh, we had to do that in order to get the data. So uh, although it's state of the art, it begs the question, why don't we measure this uh, temperature some other way? Why isn't there a way to measure the temperature from the control room and at least have an idea uh, the condition of the gear before we approach it? We have similar methods for corona detection. You can see this guy, although I'm uh, not comfortable with his level of PPE, you can see he's approached the gear, and he's got his, his listening device out, his gun, and he's, he's checking for corona. But again, if he's actually, uh, you know, more than likely he's familiar with this phenomenon, and so he has uh, probably discovered there's nothing audible, nothing uh, that he's tasting in his, in his tongue, before he's done this, but if he's just maybe going through the motions, he may have inadvertently stepped in front of a gear that's having some issues before he takes the measurement. And of course, that's what we want to avoid. So there are devices now available to us to monitor partial discharge from a distance. In fact, the, the benefits are, are cascading because in addition to not being up next to the gear during the measurement, we can perform trending analysis. So how often is enough? Is uh, is once a year a good time to make a measurement? Is it once a month? Is it once a day? Or maybe even, even more continuous than this. Uh, and then, of course, temperature uh, and, and corona are not the only items we can measure. The, the humidity has an effect, uh, the temperature of the surrounding air and the environment. So there are plenty now of, of these environmental monitoring systems very effective at telling us about the health of medium voltage switch gear from the safety of the control room. Okay, so where are we headed? If we begin to design out the uh, the potential the potential issues related to loose joints and corona, 
And if we can install safety systems in place that uh, help us monitor the temperature and the corona over time, and since these devices, especially a breaker, breaker switchgear already have intelligence built in and relays and PLCs that are monitoring the condition of the circuit, it seems to us at Schneider Electric that where we're headed is some sort of uh, autonomous system in the future. Certainly we don't offer this today, but we're, we're getting very close. And we call this watchdog monitoring, the goal being that the switchgear as part of the Internet of Things would look something like a car. And uh, as we're moving toward autonomy in cars, why not switchgear? Again, off in the future, not something we're offering, but uh, why not? So let's talk a little bit about the cost of adding this new level of reliability. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we want to go through the total cost of ownership idea. Generally, people are concerned, of course, about the installation, the material cost of the, of the solution, and also the labor associated in installing it. But I think if we step back and take a look at the broader picture, the first cost associated with switchgear installation is really the selection of the switchgear itself. And uh, so let's refer to this as design. One of the hardest parts of the design problem is trying to figure out what does the switchgear do, what are its limits, how does it marry up with uh, other pieces in the lineup. And you can see the sorts of issues that uh, designers face here as they're thinking about uh, protection and automation, cabling, cable sizing, uh, and particularly about cable sizing, maybe where the cables enter, how they enter, sensor packages, uh, arc resistance. All of these are issues the designers face as they're trying to engineer their solution. So if the switchgear had a common form factor, always the same, it would be a lot easier to understand. And if it's easier to understand, perhaps it's easier to design and install uh, with assurance that you're getting what you want. So traditional switchgear is considerably larger than what's happening now uh, with this medium voltage uh, new generation of, of products we're looking at. And, and uh, the benefits are <clears throat> considerable. First, this design aspect, and then as we move forward, the fact that it's small means it's also very light. And our light switchgear is easier to handle. Uh, one of the aspects of handling it is, in fact, that the cables, when they're run in the, in, the, uh, in the factory, they're stubbed up through the concrete. So they're already in position before the switchgear gets on site. A significant cost related to the installation is in moving the switchgear over the already positioned conduits. This usually takes a, a lot of effort, cranes, uh, forklifts, sometimes, sometimes they're not available as a result of uh, available space. And so wouldn't it be nice if the switchgear were manageable and could be pushed into position maybe even with human hands? Traditional switchgear weighs tons, at least a ton, each section. And what we're looking at here is uh, the benefit of a much less heavy switchgear. In the case of Premset, for example, we're talking about 600 pounds as compared to the equivalent switchgear that would be maybe 2,500 pounds. Uh, and given that it's smaller, it's easier to cable as well. Uh, certainly there are cable bending issues and we have to manage uh, the size of cables. But in general, installation is about, uh, when it comes to cables, is about access. And this gear and many of our new generation of switch gear, they're cabled from the outside, which allows the installers to put more people on the job of making up the stress cones and putting them in position outside the switch gear while they're sitting comfortably on the ground, not inside.
So another aspect of installation is uh, related to, it's very similar to the design, the designer's problem of having to understand the gear. Manufacturers, I'm afraid that we don't do a very good job of making this part clear to the installer. We have a lot of phone calls on this issue. And it seems reasonable that in the new gener of, gen generation of switchgear that we would begin standardizing and have pre-engineered solutions, especially around things like potential transformers. These are very common. Very often we need them in applications, but we tend to do them uh, onesie twosies. So you can imagine that this truck, which is part of our HVLCB offer, is very attractive in that it's standardized, uh, has its own wheels, can be removed, but uh, otherwise uh, one size and shape. The PTs here are shown in the middle in brown. These are voltage transformers that would be in a Y configuration. Delta configuration is also available. Uh, but really interesting is hiding in the back on the same track is a CPT, that's a control power transformer, so that all of the transformers are together in one place. Uh, and then if you can imagine that the black areas there are actually in the front of the switchgear, uh, facing the door as you open a switchgear door, all five of the fuses are available immediately uh, from the front of the gear. Very attractive, these pre-engineered solutions, and they give our customers uh, a fighting chance in the field to quickly interpret what it is that they're looking at. Now this graph on maintenance uh, was provided in confidence when someone, one of our customers, was beginning to look at uh, their costs, their actual costs, and considering how much benefit there would be with extended maintenance. Extended maintenance being uh, the ability to take a year or two or three, let's say five, between maintenance inspection activities. So the blue line is intended to show annual maintenance activities. We can imagine uh, annually taking the product offline, visual inspection, maybe looking for the evidence of corona discharge and little uh, marks on the insulation that indicate degradation, very common. But I think we know that in many cases, um, people are not able to inspect their switchgear annually. And uh, in fact, the costs associated with missing, missing the, uh, the problems associated with that you might find during inspection, of course, they're, they're very high. But if all goes well, uh, the costs could be much lower. Much lower if you, for example, were able to wait 10 years on inspection. And that's what all of this reliability uh, effort is, is taking, where it's taking us. The red line indicates <clears throat> three-year maintenance cycles. And you can see larger activities from time to time. looks like on year nine. And the yellow line is really where we want to be, which is a 10-year maintenance cycle. Uh, Every 10 years, opening, taking the, the system offline and, and taking a good close look. And you can see that the costs are significant just in maintenance alone. If, if, uh, if we look at these numbers and say blue line against yellow, we can see that the cost of annual maintenance is about three or four times the cost of extended maintenance. Not, not just double, but fairly significant, according to this client. Okay, and so when it comes to the total cost of ownership, uh, the last piece in the pie here, after we've talked about the design and installation and maintenance, is the idea of future expansion. Certainly this is paramount in most of our customers' mind now, although it seems that many customers were not uh, so worried about it in the past, and so sometimes we see installations that are simply tight, no more room. And so we, uh, we're, we're beginning to work with customers on future expansion uh, thinking such as uh, space reservations, physical space reservations for additional sections. In some cases, even installing a shell without any bus inside for the potential of filling it up for future needs later. 
Similarly, in electronics, all of our, almost all of our center electric offerings have connected, uh, have, have Modbus connectivity features for future expansion, uh, for whatever comes up. And so we can always add communications uh, as needed and uh, take advantage of some of the capabilities each meter might already have uh, that we may not be using today. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, manufacturers are beginning to strive, uh, are striving to provide solutions for these modern issues that you're seeing in the field. And uh, they generally have to do with, with the availability of skilled maintenance workforce and, uh, and what happens in the future, availability of funds, uh, especially in terms of capital investments in the current environment, available space in terms of uh, physical constraints in your workforce, and especially when it comes to uh, some of our older facilities, which drives us toward small footprint switchgear and uh, higher capability and higher reliability in the same size and space where, we've, uh, ha where we have installations from the past. And of course, all of this must ensure the safety of our workforce today and in the future. Emphasis is on reliability. Our new designs, our new medium voltage switchgear uh, solutions really are focused on reliability in terms of design at the component level. We talked about component level and managing especially corona. Installation and operational innovations, uh, especially related to grounding and the way that we ground uh, our gear during maintenance activities. Fixed breakers are beginning to take us in a new direction here where we have the opportunity to rethink the racked out position. The racked out position may not be the only way to ensure that we have uh, removed the power when we enter a switchgear. In fact, it may be attractive to visually see that the power is disconnected at a disconnect rather than just an indicator uh, on the floor of a switchgear designed to the metal clad standard. As we begin to walk down this road with better management of partial discharge and loose joints, potentially monitoring them and uh, having continuous measurement at the control booth and, and the trending, it's also possible to extend our maintenance. And so these maintenance intervals now with some of our new products are at 10 years. That's a 10 year maintenance cycle published as opposed to one years in the past and that's that's a considerable that's that's what Donald Rumsfeld uh, in the military would have cons would have referred to as an order of magnitude change transformational change. So that concludes my presentation on the increased reliability and decreased cost of new generation of medium voltage switchgear. On behalf of the CFE Media and Plant Engineering, thanks for attending to the webcast, Copyright 2016, CFE Media. This concludes our webcast. Thank you very much.